Okay, so a few little disclaimers before we begin. Yes. Um, just to let you know that this is not a private conversation, although it feels like it, um, but will ultimately be made available to the public. Um, we want it to be an enjoyable experience, so if at any point we start talking about something that is less than enjoyable. I thought of that, yeah. Um, just let me know, or if you need to take a break, just let me know those things. Uh, my role in our conversation is actually to talk as little as possible. Um, so I will largely be listening to you and, and <laughs> steering the conversation and asking follow-up questions. Um, and I also might be looking down at my notes occasionally, but rest assured that I am absolutely uh, actively engaged. Sometimes I'm verbose, sometimes I'm not. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. Oh, great, great. Okay, so the, the formal introduction is, uh, well, actually, let me, let me clarify first. Is your last name pronounced Vale? Yes. Okay. So today is Friday, July 15th, 2016. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I'm interviewing Teddy Vale here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And actually, for complete disclosure, we are in the Urban Life Building in the recording studio. Um, and this interview is part of the uh, university's Special Collections and Archives uh, Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before beginning, if I can just get your verbal confirmation that you consent to be recorded. Yes. Okay, so uh, we can start at the, the very beginning. If you can um, describe when and where you were born. I was born in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And the date? I mean, Ju July 20th, 1946. Okay, so a birthday on the horizon. Right. Um, and what was your family's background, particularly any connections to the South? Uh, my, well, my grandfather is the cousin of Abraham Lincoln, a cousin. That's where this thing comes from. His great-grandmother was his, was Lincoln's sister. How interesting. And, um... So he has been here all of his life, from Kentucky, rural Kentucky. During the Depression, he went to, uh, he walked every week to the CCC camp and came home every weekend. And he, he was 22 years old at that time, I think. Um, my, he married my grandmother when she was 15. She was from the South also. She was an interesting character. Mm -hmm. um, she was not allowed to go to school. Both her parents were dead by the time she was eight. She lived with her grandmother who treated her like a servant. And um, she was not allowed to go to school after the first grade. So when she got married, she went back to the school and got herself all the way through elementary school, went to college, same time my aunt went her daughter, her oldest child, and graduated and taught high school. Wow. And is this the maternal or paternal? And rural Kentucky, maternal, I'm sorry. Uh, paternal, my aunt, let's see, my grandfather, and grandmother on my father's side ran a country store. And um, during the Depression, they collected the property mm. because people would need stuff. And so that's how they collected land. And then my father went, and my grandmother, his mother, was college educated, which was very unusual for their time. Mm -hmm. And um, she rode horses. They were from rural Kentucky, um, asphalt country, where they mined asphalt. Okay. And um, my father went to West Point 
and my mother went to college at the same place my grandmother and my aunt went, to Western Kentucky University, where I wound up also. Mm. And how did your parents meet? Uh, they were sweethearts from the age of 12. <laughs> My father graduated, both of them graduated at 15 or 16 from high school. And my father went off to college at UK for a couple of years before they would let him get into West Point mm -hmm. because you had to be 18. <laughs> And his birthday was in July also. Okay. And what did what did your family, your parents do for for a living? Uh, well, my father was in the military. He died in Vietnam. And my mother, in the military back then, you had to stay home if you were the wife. So that's what she did. When he was overseas, he was in Korea right after World War II. And my mother worked doing stuff near us. Mm -hmm. So she was nearby, door-to-door -door sales. And tell me about your, your childhood and schooling experience. Well, I went to school, as you can imagine, quite a few places. I can remember them all. I started out in Massachusetts for first and second grade. And then, because uh, my father was at MIT for his master's, he graduated, he was graduated from West Point in 45. Went into the Corps of Engineers because the top of the class could pick their um, field. And so he picked the Corps of Engineers and um, said they were also sent to graduate school. And so he went to MIT. Um, I say, I remember them all. But um, the main thing was, we went, I went to high school, the last three years of high school in Greece, during a time of upheaval. Uh, that was when Kennedy was killed, and then Johnson was suspected by the Greeks of uh, being the murderer. So there was a lot of upheaval, mm -hmm. and um, there would be general strikes, and so all the Greek kids would not come to school that day because they were in the strike. But I am dark, so I looked at Greek. So sometimes I would go into the crowds also and watch what they were doing. Mm. <laughs> and they would go to the embassy and protest, and my father was at the embassy. <laughs> and I spoke Greek, too, so that helped. Yeah. Like an American, but I spoke Greek. And was your father's role... So he went to MIT and had been working in the, um, go on. Uh, he um, des designed the Greek National Highway, the first one they had. And um, he worked in, well, Corps of Engineers, always on the coastlines. Uh, but when we were in Greece, he was at the Pentagon learning how to be a spy, because that's really what he did. Mm. <laughs> he was assistant military attaché, and he would, he had, um, I guess, a top secret clearance, and he would, when we would go up to the border, and my father would say, stay here, and he could cross over to the real border. He could cross over the fake border and go into no man's land. In Greece? Yes, and take pictures of Albania and stuff like that. Mm. <laughs> and was Greece the last post before he before went to Vietnam? Before Vietnam, yes, correct. 
He was sent to Fort Campbell, Kentucky um, to be a battalion commander, but they knew why he was going to go. <laughs> so, but he wasn't officially assigned to the war until August of 65. And then he went over then to Vietnam. Then he went over there and, and died, right. Do you know the circumstances? Because it seems yeah, that I he do. was a I do. pretty it, high up officer. Was, he was, before there was General killed it toward the end of the war. Before that, my father was the highest ranked person to die in Vietnam. Um, he had designed a port at Cameron Bay. And they were flying over doing the final reconnaissance because he was going to a command position where he w it would be safe. And they were doing their final reconnaissance, and he was in a Huey helicopter. And eight VC stood up and shot into the helicopter. And my father was the only person hit. Ironically, there were eight people in the helicopter also. <laughs> and he was hitting in his liver. And so they did, because he was an officer, they did 45 transfusions, but he didn't make it. His last words were, I'm hit, I'm hit. He was leaning out, taking pictures. <laughs> mm. And what sort of Oh, and I was defense? married to my first husband at that time. We were in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and he was an intelligence officer. Um, and it was not a good marriage. <laughs> <laughs> he committed domestic violence. He did all the classic things separated me from my friends and family, the whole routine. And um, I did not take it lightly. <laughs> and then I found out that he had been pulling rank um, in line at the commissary or the PX, wherever he was shopping. Using my father's name, and that made me angry also. And I went to college then. I had gone to college for one semester, not quite a semester, at a college, Murray State University. Uh, when we came back from Greece, I was tucked into coming back to the U.S. I had been given interest to the Sorbonne, and I turned it down to come back to the U.S. But um, little did I know that they had just integrated the college, and I had black friends. I, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. My parents had not raised me in a racist way. And um, I, I'm sure I got some, but it wasn't a conscious thing. And... Um, I so said, I had black friends, I'd never thought about it, and I was harassed at school, and I, I left. I attempted suicide, and I left. What were you arrested for? I left the oh. school. Mm. I was just harassed. Oh, by harassed, By the teachers right. and yeah. the students, the white teachers and the white students, big time. And harassed to the point of a severe uh, depression. Oh yeah, I had one teacher. I would go to class. It was a he was a biology teacher, and I was there every day. I never skipped a class. And um, towards the end, just before finals, I left at final time. Just, uh, he had said, "You have never been here. Were you here?" And I was there every day. Yeah, so it was very clear that he was going to fail me. It was bad. So then I got married to my first husband, went to college, got in trouble there, but 
for dancing. <laughs> for dancing outside of a car. And um, what college was that? Austin P. State University of a college then, because they were nearby, and um, they were in Tennessee. Murray was in Kentucky, and that was the school I was talking to going to <laughs> by Dusty Stewart, who was an author, a minor author. And he had stayed at our house and talked me into going. <laughs> mm. Then we must, before before yeah, that, can we go back a little bit um, and talk a bit about your childhood interests and aspirations? Oh, okay. Um, I read a huge amount. Every book I get, I didn't even like cereal, but my mother didn't allow us to read at the breakfast table, so I ate cereal because I could read the box. <laughs> at night, uh, we all ate dinner together, which is the way I raise my kids too. And my father, our assignment was every day to read something in the paper besides the funnies. And we would discuss current events at the table in a non-judgmental way. <laughs> um, I read a lot uh, and danced. I loved to dance. So when I got out, I just danced all the time. Um, I took ballet, I guess, from six to eight, and um, I also belonged to Girl Scouts. And I just remember one time, when I was about eight, the um, ballet teacher got mad at her husband, who played the piano. Well, that pissed me off, so I quit. <laughs> I just couldn't stand bad treatment. <laughs> It drove me crazy, <laughs> but no major other interests. Are there any authors or books that you recall most no. fondly? No, not really. Oh yeah, well, Jane Austen. Ah, yeah, ah. <laughs> I've read her so many times, but when I was young, I'll read those. I don't know if you ever had them. They aren't biographies. They would have these biographies of people in books that had an orange cover. And I read all of them. I would go to the library and check out everything I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. I held books. But and Jane Austen was my main one, I guess. But I read everything I could. Are a lot of mysteries too. Mm. I remember my one of my favorites, but um, the uh, there were only a couple of them was Trixie Belden because she was working class. She lived in a trailer with her father. Her mother was dead, but and she was solved mysteries, so she was very independent, not like um, the Kellen Keen one, that one. Mm. She was great. I loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you mentioned being in school in first or second grade, um, and then and then we jumped to Greece. Oh, uh, right. Where, well, where are some of the other places? Let's say. Um, Massachusetts, back to Virginia, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, because of my father. Um, let's see that. Was there. And then back to Kentucky to go to school there. That was fun. All my relatives taught at that school. Hey, it was a one room school building, but it was like a lot of different classes, but I'm not one room, one building. Mm. And, uh, 
I had an aunt that taught first grade, another taught second grade. My mother taught third grade. <laughs> My grandmother taught high school. That was upstairs. The elementary school was downstairs. Mm -hmm. And the year I was in second or third grade, yeah, third grade, I guess, um, I got, uh, that might have been this thing. And I couldn't even go to the last day of school. That made me mad. I'd been there, and I never quit school. I never, ever skipped, ever, except for my junior year. Um, they had, there was a couple of teachers. They, the school was, Run off the headmaster system, but a lot of the Americans came in my junior year, and it kind of took over the school in Greece again. Mm -hmm. I dropped again to Greece, and um, this couple were Americans. They were evidently sleeping together because they were seen coming out of the same building, mm -hmm. and. They fired the guy, and that, uh, they fired the woman, I'm sorry, they fired her. And so we all walked out of the school. First period was the freshmen, second period the sophomores, third period the juniors, fourth period the seniors. We all left and walked home. And our parents were all upset, <laughs> I remember that. But we were mad and very angry. And what was the outcome? Oh, well, they didn't hire her back. Mm -hmm. um, nothing much happened. We were convinced to go back. But they never did stuff like that again. They didn't use those kinds of behaviors as judgment, mm. hopefully. Nothing else ever occurred, and the teachers didn't feel cowed. And that was the main thing. <laughs> and did you live anywhere else abroad other than? No, no. Grace was it. Then we came back to the U.S. And I'm, okay, so third grade, fourth grade, I where was there for fourth grade? I don't remember. I'm just, oh, Fort Leavenworth, fourth grade, I was still in Kentucky, fifth grade, and fifth grade was Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. My father was at command of general staff school and um, put the military thing you have to do. And then the fifth and sixth grade were in Galveston, Texas. Um, there was an influential teacher there in sixth grade, Mrs. Bodansky. I love her. <laughs> what was her name again? Mrs. Bodansky. Okay. B-O-D-A-N-S-K-Y. Mm. And um, the seventh grade was uneventful, um, except for one day, gosh, I hadn't thought about this in years. <laughs> one day I was in the cloak room getting my coat, and two guys came in and went down my shirt, and that really upset me a lot, but I never told anyone because I was ashamed. And um, anyway, so I was through the seventh. The eighth grade was in Pacific Grove, California, because my father and mother were in the Greek language school. And then we went to Greece. Oh, we went back to D.C. for the ninth grade, because uh, my father was at the Pentagon learning how to take pictures. And um, at night, he would use us as the guinea pigs. We would have to go odd places, and my father would take pictures. <laughs> uh, 
So he was learning how to use the camera. Then for 10th, 11th, 12th grade, we were in Greece. Mm. And that was great fun. Near Athens, great fun. I loved it. I had a great time. What what made it? Made fun? friends. Had a lot of friends, of course. Uh, boyfriends, and had a lot of Greek friends too. And then on my senior year, I was raped by my boyfriend. What I never told anyone about either. That was a very bad experience. Mm. And then by freshman year, I went, like I said, to Murray, where I was given a hard time. We came back here. And then I got married to this creep. <laughs> but he would let us go on Sundays to my mother's eat. We ate out every profit because it didn't cost him any money. <laughs> um, and then my father died. So he, then my husband decided to get out of the army, I think because my father was dead. And we went to a uh, Republican private graduate school in Arizona, uh, some sort of business school. And um, I learned Spanish there. He became a banker in New York. We separated when he moved to New York, and I went home to Kentucky and got a divorce. It was a bad situation. I was very relieved to get a divorce. My mother pushed me into going back to school right away. So I went to Western, and I was there six months with some very interesting people in the house. And I met my boyfriend. We were together two years before he graduated. He was a plaque. He was during all the civil rights upheaval. And um, then we closed down the school at Kent State. Or not closed down the school, but darn near closed down the school. And I left because I didn't see any point in going back to college. And after Kent State, you guys closed down Western Kentucky or you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, not closed down, but, but a lot of people were there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to Louisville. I moved home, moved to Louisville, but I didn't. I lived home only a few months. I went to a commune and worked on a paper called the Louisville Free Press. Okay, before we get there, that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to go back just and. Um, ask, you mentioned Mrs. Badansky as such an influential figure. How was she influential? I, do, I had a lot of respect for her, and she um, really pushed for further education for me. She was the first person, I think, outside of my home to realize that I was similar to and so she, they didn't have special programs back then, but she tried to get things done for me. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's the main thing. It was very clear that she knew I was bright. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I had a lot of respect for her, probably because of that. And what was the sort of political climate of of your household? You you mentioned that you were all tasked That's with reading. That's hard. Yes. Um, 
my father was in the army. I imagine my parents were voted Republican, but my father's family was Southern Democrat. And so I don't know. Honestly, I know that they voted for Eisenhower because my mother used to play bridge with Mamie. <laughs> and so they kind of, my mother knew her. And so they, I'm sure, voted for the Eisenhowers. My mother, then I don't know. I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, my parents really did not discuss politics uh, at all. But both my brothers are very right wing. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm the odd man out. <laughs> you mentioned that um, in reference to the really bad time that you had at Murray State, particularly around issues of uh, a race. Yeah, <laughs> and that your parents had not inculcated at all. I had no idea. None. The first thing I recall was the day we came back to the U.S. was the day those three guys in Mississippi were missing. And um, that scared the hell out of me. So I thought, what have I come back to? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. That was it. But my parents never prepared me at all. They, I don't, I assume they knew, but I did not. I had no idea. And where would you mark your sort of political coming of age and how that came to be? You, we had gotten to the point of you it working. It was, I think, a progression. Um, when I got divorced from my first husband, a lot, right around the time of the divorce, um, what's her face? The woman from New York, who's now, but I can't remember her now. The feminine mistake had just, she came out with that, and I read that, and it was huge click. I went, oh, God. <laughs> And um, then, also, a little bit later, I became against the war. But when, first, when my father was for, uh, well, when Johnson came on and announced it in August about the mining of Fifong Harbor, and we were all sitting in front of the TV watching that, and my father said, oh, I'll be going to Vietnam soon. And he was. He was gone three months. And, um, four months, four months. And, um, as long as my father was there, and right after he died, I was kind of not in favor of the war, but not opposed. And then when we were at that school in Arizona, I met a woman who was Bautista's granddaughter. And she hated Bautista. <laughs> so that was, but some of the other people there were involved in the Bay of Pigs. And so I was getting their view plus its other view, but I think that had influence also. God, I thought it was a seven years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so when I got out of that environment, I became against the war. It was it became very clear to me, and then when I became more of a feminist, and then against the war. Uh, my politics changed. 
<laughs> it was a progression. Everything was a progression. How did your did your family respond to your evolving uh, politics? Okay. Oh. <sighs> uh, my mother was more appalled that my boyfriend was black than anything else. <laughs> my youngest brother at the time was not a right winger. He was also against the war because he was a pacifist. And my middle brother, also who is not right wing, he always was very, pretty much right wing, was in Vietnam. He was lieutenant. And I was afraid that he'd be fragged. But he survived. And he came back and he got so pissed at my other brother that he broke his arm. <laughs> they had a huge argument. <laughs> Didn't speak for many years. Wow. But then the other brother's politics changed too, and he became very right wing, which he is now. Both of them are. And where are you in the birth order? I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm the only one with that. Well, they're all smart. Everybody is smart. Both of my brothers had perfect scores on their college boards. Perfect scores. I did not. I took my college boards the first year they came out with them in Greece, drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't even see the paper some of the time. <laughs> but I had a wonderful time the mm. night before. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't have an age limit on drinking. And we have been drinking every weekend. Sure did. I drank a lot. Mm -hmm. So we had gotten to uh, that you were working at the Louisville Free Press. Uh, yes. Um, that How was did a, you come into that? Um, I had moved back to Louisville, had gotten an apartment, and had read their paper and called them up, basically. And they had gotten into politics, but they didn't start that way. The two people who started it were one was a prostitute and the other was her husband and a pimp. And they had started to basically try and broadcast their story because they didn't feel they were correctly treated. He wound up in jail, but they had developed their politics from that. And so it became a very political paper. And um, I was a staff writer and it eventually took over and the situation was bad. I was more like a mother. I became the editor than I was a journalist, I felt. What year did you start there? Like 71, I guess. Yeah. And we came down here. I guess I started before 71, 70. And because we came down here in November of 71. So you were with that paper for about a year? About a year. And what sort of... Uh Writing were you doing for the paper? Uh, I was doing political writing, but um, partially investigative and partially just taking stuff from LNS, which is Liberation News Service, and doing that kind of stuff. What was the, what was the sort of left-leaning and or counter-cultural scene in Louisville like uh, at that time? Okay. <clears throat> it 
not as big as some places because it was a small town. But we had some relationship with Anna Carl Braden from the Southern Patriot. And my husband had done photography for the Southern Patriot. And uh, he was dating of my roommate. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> Phil and I wound up together, and we came down here. And when, when was it that you guys started dating? What around what year? <sighs> we didn't start dating until June of '72 or May. We had known each other for much longer, but we didn't officially start dating until then, May or June. Of 72? Yes. Once you were already in Atlanta. Uh, 71, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. 71, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. And so you started dating in June of 71 and you moved to Atlanta? In November, the Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> So you you became pregnant pretty quick, early real in the relationship. Real fast, real fast, real fast. And what drew you to Atlanta? My husband, <laughs> and I'm the one that wound up on staff. He wanted to come here and work on the bird. I read the bird. But I was pregnant, I was craving Chinese food, and he had been offered a job in Boston. That's my phone, ignore it. Somebody must, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, um, so, but we wound up, I lost the argument, and we wound up down here. And so, remind me of the argument. Like he wanted he to come. He wanted to come here, and, and I wanted to go to Boston. To Boston. He had been offered a job doing just photography in Boston. For another paper? Oh uh, uh, no, I think for an organization of some sort. I don't remember much else. We came down here, and uh, see, we drove to the bird that day. It was snowing. And nobody was there. There was a skeleton crew, of course. It was snowing and Thanksgiving, or just before Thanksgiving. And um, so we went to the bird. A few people were sitting around, and we just came back the next day to talk to more people. And I got an assignment. I guess Phil got a photography assignment. He did not write to go to Florida and report on the farm workers. So um, we wrote a story on the farm workers. Phil took the pictures, and I wrote the story and submitted that. And I went on staff in January. Of 72. Of 72. And where was where was the office located at that time? At that time, it was on Westminster Road. Then um, I worked for several months. Then I was very due. The fire bombing happened just before I went into labor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the last day I was there, as a matter of fact, because I went on maternity leave because I was due in a couple of days. And the fire bomb happened that night. It was a Friday. I want to pick up there, but what what was your impression of it, Atlanta when you got here? I told you that it was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, But in those first couple no, of months, I'm, yeah. No, I'm, I'm trying to recollect. Um, there was a larger left-wing community here, certainly, than in Louisville. And I felt it very embraced. Um, we found a house to live in right away. 
one of the people we lived with wound up being manager of the King Center for years and years. The name was Steve Klein. And the other guy was the carpenter. He was a creep. And uh, he would troll. He would go up to 10th Street where the runaways were selling their bird and just surviving on the street and would find attractive girls, bringing them home and have sex with them and then pick up to the curb. And I got very pissed at that then. I said, we got to get out of here. So we started looking for a place to move to. And Karen Lane and Chet Briggs and Anne and Harbro Maine lived in a house on St. Charles. And um, Alvin Brill lives in that house now. He was a staff person later. Chet and Karen were on staff. Or Karen was, and she worked at CCCO, which is the Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors. Mm -hmm. His, um, that's what he did. And um, we moved in there. Anne and how were splitting up. And we were moving in while they were splitting up. <laughs> and so we were all there. <laughs> at some point, all mm -hmm. of us. <laughs> but they were in the process of breaking up. And they had a daughter. And where was Rita. the first place? What, what the, was her name? Rita Romaine. Uh, she's a teacher in North Carolina now. Mm. Um, she was about three years old at the time. Two or three. Um... And the first house was uh, right off of Piedmont Road. It's all high rises now, but these were old houses near the DAR house mm -hmm. in that area. Right by the park. Yeah, yeah, right by the park. Mm. So it was only a couple of blocks of walks to work. <laughs> So I did that till we left there. We were only there about three months. Then we left and moved in with Karen and Chet. And we were there quite a while till my son was three. And Karen and Chet, well, and Howard split up. They were both on staff, I think, at the bird. And um, Karen and Chad bought house in Grant Park. That was when they were very cheap. They were urban pioneers. Mm -hmm. And um, we stayed in the house and rented out the spare room to a guy we knew who was a comfort, not that bad guy. No, I had nothing more ever do with him. Uh, we were there till my son was three. Mm. Then we moved on to Seal Avenue where a lot of bird people lived, which is like two blocks away. And moved in with a friend of ours who had been married to Jean Guerrero. Who Pam? was on staff. No, Pam Beardley. Oh, okay. And who is now a nun and lives, she's a Buddhist nun and lives in Dharamsala, India. Mm. Uh, but we moved in with her and lived there several months. We were, then we moved into a house we rented on Monroe Drive. And we liked that house except for a couple of minor details. It was on Monroe for one thing. And we bought a house on Orwood Avenue in Orwood Park, which is near Grant Park. And we were very much urban pioneers at that point, but a lot of leftovers were over in that area. 
So we saw a kind of secure. I used to joke that they could drop a bomb on those two neighborhoods and kill a lot of us. <laughs> But that was, um, Nan, I think, Nan moved over about the same time from Grand Park, just one, literally one block away, same street number, one block. No, we lived down the street when we first moved there. Then after 12 years, we moved in the same neighborhood to a much bigger house because my mother was with me at that point and I needed a larger house. Mm -hmm. She had the same thing as I have. And, and what is that? It's called Spinocerebellar Retaxia, S-C-A. I have type 5. It's only found in Lincoln family, relatives of Abraham Lincoln. But the whole disease, there are many of them. There are 130,000 people that is worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's a very rare disease. And mine is even more rare. <laughs> Because they only one family. Yeah. To get back to um, some of the... <laughs> shortly after you moved to Atlanta and that period of the late 60s and 70s, were there... You, you had mentioned Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. Were... There are other books or music oh, or art. Oh, at that point, I was reading everything I found just so I could get my hands on. Um, one of the main things that I was a big influence of Robin and Morgan did, did anthology of women or anthology of feminists. So I can't remember now. I love that and Simone de Beauvoir. Mm -hmm. I just read everything about feminism I could. And with that interest and passion, <laughs> orientation to the world, how did that... Orientation to the world, that's exactly right. How did that play out at the okay. bird? Okay, okay. Um, that was not a problem. We've had these criticism, self-criticism sessions every, I think, Friday. I'm sure you've heard about that. And um, from there, a lot of people very much moved left. They became involved with the October League, which was a communist pro-Chinese organization. And uh, when I left the bird, I left the bird after two years. So, 73, 74? 74, I mm. believe. And um, it, there was a political struggle going on at the bird at that time. And there was a very heavy influence of their October League. I was doing other left-wing stuff, of course, outside the bird at that point, because that's my whole milieu was that. And um, the one of the um, let's see, okay, so uh, one person was very influential in voting me off the staff. Which I was not about, I was in better about leaving staff, but I was better about her. And then I remember one night standing in my kitchen right after I'd left the bird, and she came over, the balls of this woman, and said, oh, I'm going to be your worker contact, your terrible contact. I wanted to slap her face. <laughs> She had gotten me off the bird, so I 
would become a worker. And I went to work at Sears, which is right up the street. But I wasn't a, a worker, I was an office worker. And, but I had, I didn't completely hide my politics, but I did some point. But I was doing other left-wing stuff at that point. Um, but I tried to get them to organize and stuff like that. There had been a strike of real workers at Sears just before I went to work there. But that was of the, um, I guess, merchandise handlers. Mm. But I was working with the office staff and tried to elevate their consciousness, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And I was there seven years. Are you comfortable naming the person who caused this rift at the bird? Paula Cohen. Ugh. <laughs> to this day, I still can't stand the thought of her. What balls. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Then, when I left the bird. Because you had been staff. Yes. Right. And but we had elections every few months for staff people. Mm. And I was finally voted off staff because they were trying to get more October League people on the staff, I think. And during your time there, was it still rotating staff and rotating positions? Yes, yes. And what positions did you Well, I fill? didn't rotate. Not everybody rotated. Mm. And I didn't rotate. I stayed the office manager, basically. Did a little bit of writing, but mostly office manager and some editing. And tell me about, tell me about being the office manager. What, what did that entail? Rob me from Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> that was pretty much it. I did mail. I had that stuff to people for puzzle articles on who was doing what job. I would hand them stuff to prove or interesting stories that they might want to investigate. Um, the kind of thing, and whenever, like, books are sent to us, and magazines are sent to us, newspapers, that kind of thing. And some things I would keep and do a review on, and some things I would hand to other people to review. And I wrote, I paid people their salaries mm -hmm. and paid bills. Mm -hmm and got the mail. <laughs> the general office manager stuff. Mm -hmm. There was no other person doing that kind of work. So it was me. Who did you take over from when you... I don't remember. Mm. I just don't remember at all. Mm -hmm. Probably because I was pregnant. <laughs> How much would you say you were in the office per oh, week? I was there at least 30 hours a week, probably 40. I was there all the time, at least. I was not there when they put the paper together on Monday or Tuesday night. They put the paper together. I was not there for that. And... Um, when they sent the paper out on Thursday or Friday, I was there. Sometimes I would help with preparing addresses to send them out. Just because I was office manager did not mean it. I didn't do other stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> and then I had my kid, and at six weeks, I guess, I came back and I brought him with me, and he grew up the bird. He was there with Clavis, too. Mm -hmm. 
And do you almost too? Do you recall what you were compensated for this work? Forty dollars an hour. Not an hour. You said Couldn't forty dollars an hour. Forty uh, a week. Forty a week. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. Possibly should have been forty an hour. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking <laughs> as a nurse practitioner. Mm. When I retired, but it should have been more. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes. big difference. <laughs> and what, when you arrived at the paper, you were pregnant, but had been doing writing at the Louisville Free Press. Yes. And if I ha recall correctly, sort of the first assignment that you and your husband did was to go down to Florida. Right. Where I met some less hungers also who drove me around, drove us around. And this guy that we met we became very good friends. He was very nice. And I found out later that he was involved in a bombing. <laughs> but he was very nice as. He was involved in which bombing? Um, some sort of bombing in Florida. Mm. At in the early seventies. I can't remember anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anything else. <laughs> so from that first sort of gig that you had with the bird, um How did you come into the office management? We were staff? there a lot. We were just there a lot. And um, I guess I ran for office. He always ran for office. And I guess I did. We were just there so much. Somebody probably said, Why don't you run for office staff or run for staff? And so I did. Mm -hmm. And Phil was never interested. He never did that. He just wanted to take pictures, which he did. Um, the May, early May cover is me having just given birth to my son. My husband took the picture, and it's a sepia photograph, and it's me and my son. No, oh, that's fantastic. I'll have to go look. A few minutes old. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. So what do you recall about, you mentioned the Friday critique Sessions. sessions. What And what do you rem recall about those and the staff meetings? Everything just became more left oriented, which is okay with me. But um during the criticism, self criticism sessions, uh, we would go around to a person and talk about anything that happened on staff that week, like if we felt that someone had been sexist or classist or racist, you know, that kind of stuff. It was Never personal. It was always political. Objective, I guess, almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. And and we would just say, well, then we would talk about how, at the end, I guess, then, uh, then we would talk about ourselves. We would criticize if someone else, if we felt something. And they talk about what we could do to improve ourselves. That was the self criticism. Mm -hmm. Or if we had been such a racist or classist. And then I guess we would just, that was the end, we would just go around to every person. I don't remember how we started or how we ended, mm -hmm. or who was responsible, but that's the way it worked. 
And also when you arrived, um, again, I'll use the, that phrase with your feminist orientation to the world, um, were you told anything explicitly sort sort of the history of, of never, the bird never no never so you hadn't been told of the feminist revolt or the women's no, revolt no 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 i stuff sifted down in time but never no it was never told to me no, I was given no history of mm. the word. It just sort of sifted down like the sessions came out of that. That thought that evolved. But um so that was the first thing. It, it was a process always of learning how things happened. But never officially. And during that time were there Many of the the founders or long serving oh yeah folks still oh, participating. Yeah. The Coffins were there. Howard was there for a while. Roger was there. Um, he was not original, but he was there. Yeah, he had just gotten there a year. And so Jean early. was around, but I don't think it was on staff then. Mm -hmm. I think he had already moved to the ACLU. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he was just finishing up when we came. I can't really remember. Mm -hmm. He was around. But it, well, several people had moved on to the October League at that point. And so I learned about the October League. But Again, not just just told to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by some down staff, I'm sure. Right. Because <laughs> that that was the most everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. And how? I'm oh, going. There was a lot of women's stuff going on at that point. Not just on staff, but other outsider staff. Mm -hmm. I remember one night coming home as we moved in with Kennedy Chad and there was a meeting going on in the living room of women talking about stuff. A consciousness raising session. Mm -hmm. And I did not become involved in that again because I, I was pregnant. And so, not terribly interested. Um, I became involved later with the Atlanta Women's Group, which is a group of, a measure of heterosexual lesbian women who met once a week to discuss, to talk. That was a very good group. We went through histories eventually of our social histories and it had no relationship to social orientation and we discovered that. Mm. And one woman and I, we devised a booklet, the first one I know of, and we didn't know what we were doing on domestic violence because we knew there was a problem with the police department. So we went down there to try and get them to begin to do something around domestic violence. We met with deaf ears, of course, but we did try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the first organization. The what, are, what year might that have been? I think that was about 73 or 74, somewhere around there. And um, there weren't too many set people involved with that. It was periphery, peripheral people. Mm -hmm. Um, but Anne Monning was involved. I think she'd been on staff 
pen barely was involved. I was. Uh, Lorraine Fontana, who had been there for a while, was involved. That's really how we got to know each other better. Mm-hmm. Who uh, were some other people that I'm trying not, to remember. Yeah. <laughs> On the bird or off the bird? Uh, Elizabeth and Joe were a couple. I don't remember the last names. They were not bird people. And Cece, who committed suicide about a year ago, um, was involved. She was a heterosexual when we started, and she came out after about three or four years. And I honestly don't remember many anybody else. There were other people who came in and out. Brianna Kaufman was involved for a while. Her brother Gus, or Smokey, was on bird staff mm-hmm. for a while. Mm-hmm. And where would you guys meet typically? We met on McClendon Avenue in Little Five Points mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Near McClendon and the street where the Unitarian Church is, Candler Street. We met near there on McClendon in a house. We rented a house that was specifically for that purpose. This was back in the days when housing was pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah. So, so the the group was able to pull resources and rent yes. a house just yes, just for just that. for the. And what was it called again? The Atlanta, the Atlanta Women's Group. Yeah. And we called ourselves the Atlanta Women's Group, a socialist feminist organization. Mm-hmm. And how long did that go on? That went on seven or eight years. So quite a while. Was there much overlap with... Um, with Alpha, the Atlanta Lesbian Feminist yes. Alliance? Yeah. A lot of women who were there were also members of Alpha. And eventually we all drifted apart a lot of women and went totally to Alpha. Mm. Because the Alpha House was also on McClendon at that yeah, time. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. sure was. I think it was nearby. Mm-hmm. Do you recall that? Did they? How how to say? <laughs> you, you you mentioned that they, they that you guys would have weekly consciousness raising rap sessions. Whatever that, you want to call it, right? Yeah. That you uh, created this brochure or booklet on domestic violence and did advocacy. Right, Um, right. What other sort of things? And did anybody live at the house? No. I see, you know, it seems to me, oh, another person was another Elizabeth. And she lived there, I think. But nobody really lived there. It was not a residential establishment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then in 1976, when my daughter was three months old, I joined the Atlanta Labor Group, which was a very left-wing socialist organization. Uh, people from, oh, certainly the left-wing community here but not all of the bird mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in the interim I had been recruited to buy the October League but I got very angry again <laughs> we were sitting in a meeting we were in a study group and um in the study group, we were starting at that time, 
the national question. This is all Marxist Leninist theory. And uh, so I said, oh, shouldn't so and so be a nation then? It was around the Native Americans. And the person who was leading the group was uh, turned out to be a local leader in the OL here. And he said, it was very, very clear that no, oh, not now. Is very Stalinist, and um, that was it for me. I never went back. And then it turned out that he wound up moving to New Mexico, staying with Native Americans. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Irony. Yes, very much so. When you said you were recruited, what what do you mean that by that? That was how they had to study groups and they invited me places. It was that kind of thing. It wasn't like someone came to my house and asked me to join, because at that point I put the kibosh on it. Mm-hmm. It was over. And that was when the labor group came into my life. So two questions about the October League. Um, you were recruited, but this is after... The I member, left the bird, yes. And that, yeah, that yeah, person yeah. had been involved. I already yeah. had a bad taste. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... Was it a a sort of closed or protected protective group? Oh, the OL? Yeah. Very much. They were a sacred organization. That's why I didn't find out until really that last time I was there that everybody else in that study group was in the October League except me. <laughs> They were all judging me, I guess, Mm -hmm. to see if I passed political muster. And then you would be, like, formally inducted? Probably. I guess. I don't know. (laughs) But, yeah. So the the labor study group... um, Tell me some, some more about that, like... Was it a, a weekly meeting, monthly? Uh, what the labor sort of? group or the study group? The labor group met every week, but we had politics one week we discussed, and one week we studied, alternated. But the study group was just for reading Marxist Leninist literature, and the labor group with other people. And it was still left wing literature, mostly Marxist Leninist, but not all. There was some famous literature too. Mm-hmm. And we still had criticism, self criticism. Everybody did at that point. <laughs> And what was that organization called? The Atlanta Labor Group. Atlanta Labor Group. And that's separate from... Very. From the study group. The yes. study group was more totally. October League. That was all October League. This was not. Mm-hmm. This was the opposite. Less wing, but not a mar- not officially Marxist Leninist pro-Chinese. And the labor group, but so you guys met weekly as well. We also met weekly. And where were those meetings? We moved around homes. And we had child care because the women insisted on that. So the we could participate. And that was always separate from our meeting. So we would hire a sitter. And everybody believed the kids with the sitter, usually in a different house. Mm-hmm. So we would not be distracted. Mm-hmm. 
And, um, that was a, as groups go, <laughs> that was a pretty good group. It was about half and half men and half women. So that was good. And, um, I, yes, I was something organizing or a chance of organization, but we didn't have the focus that the oil had. So we weren't trying to bring workers into a communist organization. It was a communist, socialist, socialist kind. It was a mixture of both. Some were socialists and some were communists, and we didn't think that was bad. Then we um, we evolved. The leg group evolved into the Central Committee for something out of New York. They were another kind of organization. This was late 70s, and I didn't like them, but I, that was when I left, and I had no more political associations. And how many people do you think were typically at any given labor group discussion? I'd say eight to ten. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but I'd say about eight to ten. Mm -hmm. And we did picnics, we did uh, for May Day, May Day picnics and stuff like that, and plays, things like that. Do you recall anything, any readings that you had or uh, topics that you engaged with that were particularly meaningful? Yeah, I remember one thing we read was by a woman who wrote this whole book, I don't remember her name or anything, basically saying that she thought men were irrelevant or would be in time. She believed that communities of women without men still was the left wing slant. And that was in the study group, and we talked about that. And didn't like it. Mm. But it, there were some things I gleaned from that that were interesting. And I read Capital. I guess there, that was where I read Capital, the first book. Loved it. Loved it. We were a lot of Engels and Marx. Mm -hmm. I remember that. That's pretty much it. And then we, we wrote some stuff. We wrote a play. I remember one. I guess it was for May Day. I can't remember the reason. But we had an event. And the play was part of the event. It was at the Georgia Hill Center. And I had written about when I worked to Sears. I remember if I was, I guess I was still there. And the name of it was terrorists for America shops because their slogan at the time was Sears for America shops. It was about a friend of mine who died of an aneurysm there who was black. And I think they didn't pay attention to her until it was too late. If she had been white, they would have paid attention, but they didn't because she was black. which I still think is the case. <laughs> yeah. To go back, um, we've covered a lot of these years <laughs> that, that flow into each other, um, but to just follow up on a couple things, um, around the time that you were working at working at the bird um, in addition to the issues of gender 
and gender dynamics at the bird. Can you speak about how race and sexuality also played out? There weren't too many black people there. There was one person who became a friend of mine, Tim Hayes, a friend of several other people. He had been with the Black Panthers, and he was a friend of Van Monty and Ted Brodick, too. Several people didn't like him. And a partly personality, partly I thought because he was a black. And uh, he married a white woman. She gave birth, became pregnant, gave birth. She was from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, not Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And um, I, they were moving up there, and. Nobody was helping him, and I organized a bunch of people to go over to their house and move, or their apartment and move them, get them packed up. But no one was helping them at that point, and I thought that was pretty bad, too. Mm. And sexuality, we had several gay people on staff. They were very out. And that was not an issue at all, at all. I never saw any discrimination against the gay people at all as a bird. And in the weekly criticism, self-criticism? Oh, I think people began to acknowledge, not that, that there was institutional racism, which we had to struggle against. And we brought our goals, but I don't think people worked that hard to get black people involved. It was a white organization. Mm -hmm. But I never, ever, ever heard it. Any racist thing come out of anyone's mouth. There was sexism, but again, institutional. It was not anything verbalized at all, mm -hmm. ever. We were to clap down hard. <laughs> and homophobia as well. Right. Big time, yeah. That was not an issue at all, ever as it had been possibly previously, like with the women. And I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't there. And it wasn't something that lingered. No, no, not a bit. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. that I ever saw. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there any particular issue or theme or period of coverage from your years at the bird that that stick in your mind the most? Well, the anti-war stuff, I guess, is the main thing. I mean, that was a very strong theme, and that was really what we were interested in at that time. I mean, we read the other stuff, too, and thought that was great, but the anti-war stuff was important mm -hmm. <laughs> to us and pretty much remained that way. And there became more of an analysis of that politically that I think happened also. The people began to realize that that need to be talked about on the pages of the paper. We were discussing stuff on staff, but not in the paper, and that began to come out. It became, the paper became more political. 
which was probably also natural evolution. And what would that deeper analysis, can you give an example of how that... Not an article, or, I mean, I can't quote an article. Yeah, either. no. But um, just um, there be some things written in the paper, an article about the war, and an article about guns and maybe, and talking about the military industrial complex, that kind of thing. Um, and then that began to flow into analysis of what was wrong with society. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about racism and sexism and homophobia, too, in society in general. I don't think this is it for you, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. good. And there... In talking about that, you, you mentioned that it sort of became more maybe overtly political or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In its analysis. Um, and I wonder how you, how you respond. Several, several other people I have talked to have talked about the, the political cultural divide at the paper. Yeah, oh yeah, there was. And but, so you did see that. Can you yes. speak to that a, a bit? Mm, I was a more political. Mm -hmm. So that was no more important to me. Um, some people, oh God, uh, some people saw culture as a way to get more political. Um, that they had a political analysis of how there should be cultural change. Mm. Or, like, for example, some people really liked country music because they felt that people should politically identify with two people who like country music. They may have liked it initially, but they saw it as a way to affect change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, there were people who culture was it, music was it, that was really important. Um, but those people I didn't feel like had as much of an influence as people who were more political. Um, they may have originally, but they wound up not to be that way. They just didn't have as big an influence. Mm -hmm. And where did your husband fit in? To all this. Yeah, as, the, <laughs> as a photographer. He, Always warp the flow. <laughs> uh, he had political analysis. We pretty much had the same politics, but um, which is lucky after all those years. Um, but he was never as vocal as I was. Mm -hmm. He was always kind of more on the periphery because he was a photographer, but um, he was the end of taking pictures of people in the band. He was then to taking pictures of people in the street. That was his view. Mm. <laughs> so more political More political also, yeah. Did he participate in the Atlanta no. Labor Group? No, mm -hmm. he did not. He was through with everything. <laughs> mm. hey, very much so. What did you all do? I mean, he would come to events, but he didn't go to meetings. Mm -hmm.
if this is a pertinent question, <laughs> what what did you guys do for for fun, for relaxation, entertainment during these? What these did years? we do? <laughs> Probably ran and did political stuff. That was proper entertainment. But the going to a demonstration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that may be my idea of a good time. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And our kids took a lot of our time. Yeah, absolutely. Who are both very progressive. Mm. <laughs> so we're lucky there. Yes, yes. <laughs> so when you were voted off of staff, did you sever your ties completely with the paper at that point? <sighs> Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. And went and and at that point went to work at Sears. Yeah. It was more that I became very much more political and I didn't see the bird as really a part of that. That was not as left wing as I wanted to be. And what were you hoping to do at that point? through your political Have work. a revolution. Ah! <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While working 40 hours a week at Sears. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what what Sears did you work at, the location? The main one that's now in Ponce Leon, across mm -hmm. from Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. I did, like I said, I was a work. I, I worked for a buyer. I had a buyer, and I did the office of work. And also tried to get the other people more politically oriented. And I think I had a little bit of success, actually, but the because the managers hated me, which is okay with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember this one, uh, and I had no respect for them at all. And this, our boss would send these notes around several times a week, uh, correcting this or wanting this or whatever. Everybody had to sign off. And I always signed in red ink and corrected his grammar with the same pen. <laughs> I was still editing it. Yes. <laughs> and I still do. And my daughter is a magazine editor, <laughs> which is really funny. Yeah. <laughs> what was your, your husband doing for work during these years? Taggy stuff. He got into computers. Hmm. Um. And, <sighs> For a while, the comms left the bird staff sometime maybe in the middle of 72. And uh, Finnell went me like back up. When fell in probably February or so, went to work for this company. There was automotive merchandise and supply. They're not there anymore, I don't think. They were on Lee Street, I think, or somewhere in West San excuse me, they got. And um, a fellow's an organizer, and he felt they should organize their inventory. So he devised their uh, computer program. They had never computerized before, he didn't know anything. Thing either, mm -hmm. but he learned how, and then he went to graduate school and became a computer 
person. Yeah. Where did he go to graduate school? Georgia State. Okay. <laughs> and was that in the 70s or later in the... Uh, in the 70s. Yes, the 70s. Late 70s. Then when he got out, about a year later, I went back to school. And I went into nursing because I wanted to get into a woman's profession. That's why I did it. I like it too. I mean, I had no no problem, but um, I did that because they wanted to do a woman's job. And what year did you go back to school? Eighty one. Because you had left. Were you at, at Western Kentucky? Was that the yeah. last? Yeah, that's last goal. And what had 71. you been studying there? Ah, uh, languages, mm -hmm. foreign languages. But you didn't finish after after the Kent no, State never disaster. Did. Now I started back up again. If that took me, I went into nursing. It took me three or four years mm -hmm. because of that. But it was pretty much part time because I only took a couple of other classes and didn't need anything else. Mm -hmm. And so, said nursing. so you had worked at Sears from 74? 74 to 81. And then went to nursing school yes. here at Georgia State? Yes. And then where did that take you? <sighs> then I went to work at Grady as a critical care nurse, did critical care what they then called the sit down unit, intermediate care, for six months. Then went to the pulmonary ICU, then the medical ICU. We were all in the same wing. I was there for about seven and a half years. Then I went to work at the home health nurse because I wanted to go eventually to go to graduate school and become an nurse practitioner because I'm sure as hell I'm not getting any challenge as a nurse. I was I was through. I had gleaned everything I could from that and mm. I wanted to do something else. <laughs> mm. So I went back to school for that in about 2000 or 2000, somewhere in there, to around 2000. Graduated around 2002, I think, 2002 or 2003. I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. And then finished your career as a nurse practitioner? Yes, and then finished up as a nurse practitioner. Doing what type of, of nursing, nurse Everything. practitioning? Everything. Everything. <laughs> um, but my focus was family health. My last job, I had only wanted to work part-time, so I was very glad. I went to work for a chiropractor who was not an apple chaser, but almost was step up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I could work independently. I totally, I was completely autonomous. The doctor came in once a week, never on the day when I was there. So why was the autonomous I was? I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I was very happy because I never liked working for doctors, ever. Mm-hmm. Because eventually they tried to boss you around. When I first got out of school, I was independent, but there was a doctor there. And that was okay, but it was a Spanish clinic. It was, that was a very interesting month. Everybody was illegal. And they charged huge amounts of money for health care, huge. And people would pay in cash. I thought it was a rip-off. I was, but they got 
in financial trouble and legal trouble a few years later. I was really glad. Then I went to work for a friend, for a friend of mine who had an, a clinic and there was no doctor on their premises. He came in about once a month to look at charts. But I really liked that too. But I left there after about two or three years, I can't remember. And then I was doing what they call locum tennis, which is where you just move around doing, you know, temp work, temp medical work. Mm. Temp work as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And the jobs I liked, well, there's one job I really liked. I hit off with all the staff, including the doctors and everybody. But it's a peach tree city. I didn't like. They wanted me to come work for them, but it's too far. I don't want to do that. But if they'd been closer in, I would have taken the job. I loved it. But um, I then also worked in, in the prison system. I worked a lot down in Jackson in the men's prison and a lot in the women's prison metro, which is now closed down. But um, that was a very interesting thing too because the medical care sucked in both places. So I, I would do the best I could. And I actually saved a couple of lives. Mm -hmm. So that was good that I picked up on problems mm -hmm. that nobody Sorry. else had. Um, Noticed. And how long did you do that? I did that for off and on for several years. I then went to work. I got a job at Feminist Women's Health Center, but that was only a couple of days a week. So I worked lock and tendons while I was doing that too. And um, because they didn't need us for the abortion and care, they needed us for examinations for regular exams, proms and post-abortion care. Mm. So that's why I did this. So that was only a couple of days a week. And that was not enough work, mm -hmm. for sure. I loved it, though. I really loved it. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> That was great. That was on my favorite job for sure. And um, then I also at why, the why same time. Why was it your favorite? Because people were very accepting and bizarre women. A couple of people were transitioning from female to male, but otherwise most everybody that worked there was female. I can't even think of any men that were in the, I know there were a couple, but very minor mm -hmm. role, a very minor role. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Loved it. In most of the docs, there were one or two male docs, but most of the doctors are women also. And they're only there sporadically, but I enjoyed that. I loved that job, loved it. Mm -hmm. And I felt very useful. I did pap smears, I did medical care. It was great. Yeah. I loved it. It was wonderful. And in all of these <laughs> jobs that you've had, the the careers that you've had, <laughs> the the politics that you've been involved in. Um, how how had your experiences at the bird shaped the trajectory? Or well, certainly did. Uh, I don't think I would have gotten as much into organized politics without the presence of the bird. I would say that was my first.
first step. Because even the free press was not that much, but the bird really was. There were so many tentacles out from there. Um, so like I saw people who we were having relationships. I mean, I would see people. Um, and some people I saw more often than others. And if we had more of a relationship, it was not official. Mm. <laughs> Except for birth havers, they were with the women's group and the labor group, but they were on the bird at that point. There was nobody on staff that did those things there. So I would say that was my entree into politics, mm. was the bird, for sure. Always important to me. Yeah. And have you maintained relationships with people from the bird? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at all time, yes. Believe it or not. <laughs> like, like who were some of your closest? Oh, gosh. Uh, Jean Guerrero, mm -hmm. uh, Nan Orak, we play bridge about twice a month. Mm. Um, the Coffins, Howard Romaine is a good friend. Pam Beardsley, no longer Pam. Norton is, I guess, my closest friend. Um, Pam is your closest friend? Yeah, yeah. I'd say so. Ah, uh, let's see who else. A woman named Sunshine, who was a salesperson. Mm. She became an attorney. She's now very ill and in a nursing home, but I still see her. Ah, mm. uh, who else? Let me see. Gosh. Lorraine Fontana. Um, who else? Oh, I say in money all the time. Mm. I, I guess I just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Susie Goodman, I don't know if she was on staff, and I see Bob, but we don't have a relationship, but we see each other pretty regular. Mm -hmm. So Lorraine was on, on staff for a while? Yeah. Or... I think she was. At least involved yeah, yeah. writing and uh, things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll have to add her to our list of, <laughs> of folks to talk to. Um. She'll be in percent. Mm -hmm. She was in New York City on 9 11 and working in one of the opposite buildings next to the one that fell down. Right. <sighs> yeah, I know that she's been involved in many, many things right, over right. the years <laughs> and has been interviewed, I'm sure, many times as well, but it would be interesting <laughs> to talk with her specifically about the bird and how that intersects with um, her other interests, right, passions, right. activism. Right. Were you involved at all or aware of the goings on of the the reincarnated bird in we're aware of the goings on, but I didn't approve of them at that point. Can you say a little more? I felt they should have been more political, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I was critical of that. Mm -hmm. I was well over it by that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had moved on. <laughs> yeah. So looking back, you know, we're coming, I guess, 40 years and, and almost old, 50 old, since, yeah. since the founding of the bird. Um, how do you reflect and feel about that era? from where we're at now. It was wonderful. My God, I had nothing but good feelings. 
Um, with all gotten older and don't have the energy for doing the work that we did then, but I wish we did because I think it's needed. <laughs> I wish we had the energy. <laughs> but yeah, I have real good, I mean, I'm nostalgic from that time. But not just because it was my youth, because we were doing a lot. So that was good for me. Yes, it was a good time. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a side thing, mm -hmm. and he was involved in the birth, but he was a, a communist. I had a good friend who was in the labor room who I had known of before. He was, um, they called the breath of something. He was a communist. Well, and um, well, He was called what? Th the organization was Progressive Union or something mm -hmm. like that. And we, he and his wife and all of our kids went away every year for between Christmas and New Year's, and we still do. So that relationship is maintained. And what's for his sure. name? Nick Atkins. He lives in Columbus. Okay. And he met his wife in North Carolina doing political work up there. And do you do you guys go to the same spot every year when you travel? No. No. Well, we do now. We didn't use it. We used to go around to the state parks, but now we go to the same spot because we get a uh, four to private house and it's the bag, and we've got everybody there. there. About 21 people now. Wow. So, yeah. And we love it. Mm -hmm. We've been together a long time. Mm -hmm. So, we maintain that relationship. <laughs> yeah. For sure. We hadn't touched on it, but I also remember from the little biographical sheet that you filled out. Um, that you've been over many, many years, you were very <laughs> civically neighborhood involved. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about any of that? Or? Sure. But we didn't discuss politics at that point. Mm -hmm. But one organization that was important to me but went nowhere was the Atlanta Commission on Women. Some women on the... Um, Council, and I don't remember the years, that's so why I didn't put it on there um, at all. But they had this in the 80s or 90s, I think. I think it was the 90s. That's why I, said, I don't know. I had gone together in the council and established this commission. The city council. Yeah, the city council, sorry. And um, so every person had a representative on the commission, so they got a neighborhood person. I was a neighborhood organizer. I was involved in the PTA, and I had tried to get things done through there. It wasn't, I learned by that time, not to be open about my politics, but to do to find ways to sneak that in to things, but not say, this one, bring it. <laughs> Just to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we had done some organizing around my school and around my neighborhood. I was involved in the neighborhood association. So I was, not, I was put on the commission. And I tried to have a good influence on that. But there were women involved in the commission who wanted to only see it do well for women in business, which was good, but not my orientation. And some who just really didn't care. They just wanted, their name was something else. 
and I try to give them to do stuff around retirement in relation to women and you know that all that stuff that was actually practical and good for women and that really went nowhere. So I was there about three years that I left. Mm -hmm. I just gave up the ghost. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the credit union I was involved with, because the board, of, the board of directors, I was called up on the phone because they were low on members of the board. So I went there, I was there two or three years, and I was elected president. I think somebody had left. And we had elections every year, and I was president for about 12 years. 12 years? Of which credit union? Uh, it's not there anymore. The Grand Park Santa Credit Union, which is now merged into Bond. Several of us there wanted to see us merged into Bond, and several fought it. They wanted to be a small neighborhood credit union. It died. <laughs> where Where was it located? Cherokee Avenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, across from the pizza place on Cherokee. Yeah. Uh, across the street from Grand Central. Mm -hmm. Blue Dakota is right there. Yep. Yep. And Alice Rosie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I see here in your, your notes that, um, yeah, you were very very involved with right the credit union. oh and the, the nurse association too mm -hmm. same thing somebody who taught at the school called me up and said why don't you start coming to the meetings i joined but i never went to the meeting and i started going to the meetings i got involved and then i eventually became president of that too and i had the writing again. I had to write an article for our, our district paper every three months, mm. so I did that. <laughs> and you had mentioned the PTA. What schools did your did your kids go to? Oh, uh, um, they went to a place called which is not there anymore, called N E West, who had some history with the city. But anyway, I was right up the street from our house, and I, it was a very small school. It was a neighborhood school. It was great. I loved it. It was a great and um, mid sweet got on the board of education, and had to be gone for several more years, but it was too small a school that was in the period of consolidation and the school was too small, so it had to be merged into a larger school. So that became the community, what do they call that stuff, um, charter, high school, or charter middle school. Community Charter Middle School. Okay. So it was part of the, the public system. Yeah, for sure. But for was a very small. Many, many years, but it was a very small school, mm -hmm. which I loved. One day, as a matter of fact, the, <laughs> the kids came home. Nathan the Guerrero used to come to my house every day after school because I was at home. And so Christopher and Nathan came home one day. This is before Jessica started school there. And they came home with little plastic books. So I naturally saw a little red book. I thought I was teaching some mouth. <laughs> So I was, because it was like, just building the I end. So I was really excited. 
And Christopher started backing away. He knew I was about to go ballistic. And it was the uh, Gideons had to be handing out little Bibles. I opened up with the freaking Bible. And I did go ballistic. But this was the son of the, the director of the ACLU here. Yeah. And so I called me on the phone and said, you know your son just ran out from school? <laughs> so Dean called the school and a ruckus ensued. <laughs> yeah. But Christopher knew enough to back away. <laughs> First grade, second grade, I guess. He was a year older, so he was second grade. <laughs> he knew I'd freak out. <laughs> Which I did. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. It was so funny. So from from where we're at today, um, what are some of the the things that matter most to you? It's so boring Afghanistan. <laughs> That's what. Racism. Ah, I've been apoplectic over the last week. Because I understand what the hell is going on. And, um, I mean, it's bad. Racism is bad. But the problem is so much bigger than that. Oh, my God. And, um, I... Uh, I'm a Democrat. I'll vote for the Democrat. I consider myself now a progressive Democrat. But actually, with certain people, I'm more open than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just for reference for listeners sure. or viewers over the last week. We I know they got to get in the paper. I'm nobody. Yeah. <laughs> there have been two horrific. Murders by African American men. Right. Oh men yes, by yes, yes. And, and then a which I'm sure is racist. Sure as the day is long. And then five cops were killed in Dallas. By but I understand why. Mm -hmm. I mean it's unfortunate, it's sad, but I, it should never overshadow what's going on. Ugh. Yes. That's why I feel Fox News or not. Right. Which I will not allow in my house. It will never be on, ever. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> Agreed. Well, we have covered all the ground that I, that okay. I was hoping to. Um, are there any other topics that you'd like to talk about? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's so. I think we've done it all. Well, fantastic. I thank you so much for I, coming in. I still get upset if my husband says something. I think it's sexist. That still, still pisses me off. <laughs> that has not changed. <laughs> That's fortunate. <laughs> yeah, you still, you still have all your wits about you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for coming down. If there's anything that you would like to, that you re remember, that you would like to go into in more detail, um, just let me know. Um, we're so happy to have this on tape. I'm glad. I remember one thing when Colin Adam Braden came to town. Um, some bird staffers met with them. That was not officially a bird meeting. It was a separate meeting, but they were not approved of because they were CPUSA rather than more Chinese oriented. I do remember that. So they they were old timers and still right exactly CP USA exactly, and, and that was Vanguard disapproved. Right, wouldn't accept that. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. Do you remember 
exactly what what criticism was leveled? <sighs> Jane Guerrero and Chad Briggs and Caroline were part of that meeting. And uh, they didn't meet with other were people. I don't, I don't remember Jean being critical, but he might have been. But he was a little bit more, not, I don't want to say laid back, but more relaxed. And uh, Chet, I was on fire with him. And Karen was like, I was there too. Um, No, just the criticism was that times had changed and moved on. There was going to be a revolution and they weren't going to be part of it. <laughs> that was pretty much it. And I remember individual people criticizing them. But I do remember that. Nobody from the bird staff expressed a wish or desire to meet with them because of that opinion. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. Yeah. Well, thanks for adding that to the, <laughs> <laughs> to the record. It, it, contextually... It, well, that, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day and good luck with this thing. I only have to type and eat the supper. Okay, we're back. When Chad and Karen left here, left Atlanta, they went to Vermont. And they. Is that the 70s still? Yeah, it's still the 70s. And they went to, I can't remember the town, it's near Montpelier. And, um,. Karen became a librarian at a small library, but their main thing was to get study anarchist, which is more to his interest, study the anarchist history in Vermont, which was very interesting. A bunch of Italian stonecutters had moved to Vermont in the late 1800s, and they were anarchists in 1900s. And um, they had formed an association which they were trying to preserve. And um, they also had a community grocery store. It was basically communal. And everybody participated in putting stuff to be sold to the store, grew stuff. And it was whole community of people and they had uh, they had uh then after they had broken down the mafia came in and took over the building and a lot of it got then they abandoned it and it got flooded out but they had managed Chet and Karen to retrieve and save some of the old photos so that was really interesting. It's, I think it's still there. I'm not sure, because Jeff's dead now. But it's called the Anarchist Hall, I think it was called. Oh, cool. And uh, that was the birthday date after they left the bird. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that was with CCCO. Right. That's all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>